us versus them mentality in special education is still alive and well, unfortunately. And I know I'm here on the Special Education Inner Circle podcast talking all the time about the things that we can do to work together. And sometimes we talk about the negative side of what's happening in special education. And we talk about the staff shortages or we're talking about things that perhaps have gone wrong at IEP meetings. But I don't know, I'm feeling like we might even have a new podcast series that's going to happen right now called, you know, direct from my DMs. You know, the things that I'm hearing from teachers and parents, I'm going to share some things with you today just because I want to call them out. And and I'm not going to call the people out who sent me the DMs. I always feel like if you send me a DM, it's confidential as in I'm not going to share your name. I'm not going to screenshot it and put it out there. But if it's something that is concerning, if it's something that is a conversation that we need to talk about because it will help somebody else, I'm absolutely going to share. So today I'm bringing you kind of both sides of the table. And I hate to say it that way because, again, you know that inside of our Master IP Coach Mentorship, inside of our Special Education Inner Circle Membership, we're always talking about collaboration. But there's a reason we have to be so focused on collaboration. It's because there are things that are going wrong and there's a mindset of us versus them. So let me just share with you uh, two things that were in my DMs this week. The first one came from a post that I put on Instagram talking about how a parent should be involved in seeing the placements that are being considered for their child. I talked about least restrictive environment. I talk about full continuum of of placement. I'm talking about the big terms, the big things that we need to know when we're making decisions about where a child's services are going to be delivered. And from that post, I got a direct message that says, and I'm going to read it directly because I don't want to get any words wrong. It says, I came across your page and was interested in learning more. I am concerned you are informing parents to not consent to placement until they visit three placements. That is not the process. The IEP team discusses students' needs, which is reflected in the service delivery. It is the team facilitator who proposes one placement. Visiting programs is extremely misleading to parents. I think you should clarify your post. Just so you know, I sent her back a message that was extremely kind. And, you know, I get where she's coming from, quite honestly. I understand the old school methodology of choosing a child's placement for the parents and just saying, this is what is available. Your child is going here. I've been in that situation as an educator. You guys know I was a former teacher. I get it. I've sat through the meetings supporting parents. So after I was a teacher, I was sitting at meetings supporting parents. I've been in the meetings where that happens. What I can tell you is from best practice it, it is that we need to be including parents in that. So that, that's part of the law. We have to include parents in that. But best practice in my experience has been for parents to be extremely knowledgeable of approximately three placements that have been considered for their child so they understand what is being recommended because you don't know what's right if you don't know what's wrong. And I talk about that a lot. I talk about that a lot here on the podcast. I talk about it in our trainings. I'm talking all the time about how we need to have full disclosure of what's being considered. You know, most of the time, a parent will absolutely agree with the team on placement if they understand, like, here's the full continuum of placements in the area. And here's your child's needs and here's the services that we've agreed upon. And here's, you know, what we're thinking is going to be the best service delivery model. And we know that you've seen, you know, classroom or program A and B and C, and and we're recommending B because, okay, this is also the process that I use with parents when I want them to give some pushback to the team on what's being recommended. Uh, When I want them to say like, "Mm, I don't know if that's exactly right. There's some things that maybe we're not considering. But again, a parent can't have that conversation if they don't have the information. So for this person who works for the district to say, that's not how it goes. Do not mislead parents. The team facilitator like tells the parent where the services are going to be at. That is not true. And the thing is, I would love to sit down and have coffee with this person and say, listen, I understand that that's how it's been done in a lot of places. I understand that's how it's probably still happening in your district. But let me show you the benefits. 
and and the um, just awesome outcomes that happen when we get a parent fully involved in you know deciding placement and service delivery it can bring great things it can bring great creativity does it make the process a little bit more um detailed like maybe it's going to take a little bit longer a few more conversations a few different things happening sure it does so what so what who cares i would rather do this work up front and making sure that the parent is very confident in what's offered in their school district and why certain things are being proposed and what the options are that we're thinking outside the box where we need to to customize those different placements i'd rather do the work up front than put out a fire later okay so that was message number one Message number two was actually feedback on a podcast episode that was released a couple of weeks ago. And um, it was about assessments and it was with Charm and she is amazing. And she's going to be doing a, a high level, you know, intensive teaching with our master IP coaches and inner circle members all about school evaluations and assessments. And this person, again, I'm going to read it direct. She said, spoken like a true district staff two exclamation points. This is why my advocacy business is so busy. Two more exclamation points. Is she aware that kids with reading concerns do not have to be below the 25th percentile? She needs to update her knowledge of AB 1369. Kids with good grades can be eligible for SPED. Bad advice for your SPED parents with a thumbs down. And then she signed it with her name, Dr. So-and-so. Okay. Um, so here's the thing. I saw this feedback and I was like, all right, let's, let's break this down a little bit. And again, I'm bringing this to your attention because I'm not putting fuel on the fire for conflict. I want you to have the knowledge of what is incorrect, um, in this feedback, uh, because she's misunderstanding a bit of the podcast episode. And this happens a lot, right? In special education, we have a lot of misunderstandings and a lot of it has to do with not listening to the details. And after two decades of doing this, I'm telling you it's, you know, successes in the details, getting to um, truly prepare a child for further education, employment, independent living. It, those goals uh, rely on the details and, and you got to be a really good listener and you got to know which questions to ask. So here, let, let's, let's just pick this part a little bit. Spoken like a true district staff. First of all, the episode that she was listening to with Charm, Charm is not a district staff member. In fact, she's an independent um, evaluator and she has won several awards and has been recommended for um, several different accolades um, for her awesomeness. <laughs> <laughs> by parents, by districts, by, okay, so so she's not um, district staff, but you know what? So what if she was? So what if she was, okay? Because this, that first sentence, spoken like true district staff, it's like total wall up right there, okay? This is why my advocacy business is so busy. You know what? This is why advocacy in special education gets a bad name. I'm just going to call it out. When somebody says, I'm a special ed advocate, the first thing that you think of, well, most of us, what we think of is somebody who is against the district staff. Okay, it, 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 right there. It, she just put it out there. This is why my advocacy business is so busy because of those district staff. Stop it. It is not us versus them. Okay, then she says, is she aware that kids with reading concerns do not have to be below the 25th percentile? Okay, yes, she does. And in the podcast, and I went back and I listened to it, Charm was describing the bell curve and assessments. She's a data nerd, and, and I love it. And she was describing that when somebody is scoring between the 25th to the 75th percentile, that they're considered in the, the range of normal or like average, and that when she's initially looking at data and where a child is struggling, that when that we're looking for something below the 25th percentile to kind of trigger us to say, oh, there's the problem area. Here's what's happening. Um, here's where the deficit is at. She also continued in almost the next sentence to say, however, if a child is struggling to be in that 25th to 75th percentile of average, so let's just say there are um, behaviors or meltdowns 
or six hours of homework, right? If there are things that are happening that um, are, are definitely affecting how we're getting to that, then she's going to recommend we continue to do different assessments to say, okay, so the child's capable of learning at level, but the effort or the ways to get there is extreme. So she absolutely recommends that we continue to look at other areas. Um, so, and it's not limited to just a number below the 25th percentile. She clarifies that very well in the podcast episode. All right. The feedback also says she needs to update her knowledge of AB 1369. Did any of you guys just go, huh? What? What is she talking about? Yeah. I Googled it myself. <laughs> okay. <laughs> that is um, in California. There's um, AB 1369 has to do with dyslexia. We were not talking about dyslexia and this is not a podcast for California. Okay. So none of us are going to be up to date on all the laws in all the states. All right. I say that all the time. Not everybody needs to know everything about every law in every state, right? There, there, that's impossible. It's impossible. So she needs to update her knowledge. Actually, she doesn't. She doesn't because she's not helping people in California. She was giving us knowledge that is applicable to federal IDEA law. And then she says kids with good grades can be eligible for SPED. Absolutely they can. In fact, if you listen to the whole episode, um, I believe that she describes uh, it it might even be her own child. I can't remember the exact details that um, that there were supports put in place, uh, but academics were absolutely there, but there were some other struggles and some other things that were happening. And then she says, bad advice for you, for your step parents. <laughs> really, really? So giving more knowledge on how school assessments and um, data can be used to help prioritize what a child needs in their education is bad advice. So again, Here's why I share this. And here's why I break it down. Because this conversation, the one from the first one here, and I'm, I'm glancing down here again, where it says, you know, um, visiting programs is misleading for parents. That's an old school thought. And then, you know, advocates who, you know, are against the district staff. That's old school. Stop it. We here have the opportunity to work together to improve a child's education. If you have been burned in the past, I am sorry. I've been burned too. You learn from it and you move on. You don't take out your anger and your disappointment in another you know, situation and bring it into the current situation. Now, what's great for you guys is that if you're hearing this, I hope that it helps fuel your um, just uh, compassion almost for what has been happening and what is continuing to happen on all sides of the IEP table that, you know, a lot of times we're here talking all these positive strategies. And I say all the time, it's not all sunshine, unicorn and rainbows and special education, even though I like to think that we're moving in that direction where, you know, it's not, it's not. So being knowledgeable of what other people are saying can be helpful for you. As a parent, teacher, admin, therapist, this information can be helpful for you so you understand where other people are, are coming from. Because here's the thing. If these two people said this to me, that means they've said it to a lot of other people. It means that there are a lot of people who are still under the advisement from their school district to not let parents know too much about placement. And, and you know what? It Again, I'm not taking uh, any certain position of throwing somebody under the bus. It's not the admin or the teacher or, or the therapist specifically. Those become district habits. It's the district kind of philosophy. Um, it, it's the the limitations of what has been done in the past affecting what's happening now. And when it comes to this old school advocacy, I'm going to be totally honest with you and my master IP coaches who are listening in, they're going to, they're going to gasp a little bit because we do kind of talk behind the scenes about what to do when we are working in a situation where there has been what we call um, angry advocates. They come from the angry advocate camp. 
of just the district staff are over there. Nobody tells the truth. Um, they have possibly burned some bridges. And again, I'm stereotyping. I totally get it of what an old school angry advocate in special education um, kind of brings to the table sometimes. But you know what? That's still happening. And it would be foolish of me to think that um, all of that is just going to disappear. Are there true, awesome advocates out there that want to be collaborative? And sometimes they have to uh, bring things to, uh, I don't know, we'll say due process, state complaints, the formal procedures. Sure, those exist for a reason. Are there times as master IEP coaches that we have to kind of dig our heels in and say, no, that's not acceptable. And there's some sticky conversations and it gets very uncomfortable and we have to negotiate. And sometimes it takes more than one or two IEP meetings to get things done. Absolutely. But it should never be an immediate, you're the district staff. And that's why I need to advocate. No, no. We need to get rid of that. I'm doing, you know, what I can. I know if you're here listening, you're doing what you can. Um, you know what? Go ahead and leave a review. If you're listening to this on iTunes, I would appreciate if you would go ahead and leave a review and some feedback. Let's get the word out there that collaborative strategies absolutely do work. If you um, enjoyed this kind of direct from the DMs uh, and sharing what other people are experiencing or their perspective on special education, make sure you share a DM with me. Again, remember, anytime you send me a DM, I'm not going to screenshot it. I'm not going to shout your name out. Um, but I do love to bring to light the conversations that have all been kind of tucked behind the scenes in special education. And the only way for us to all work together is to start to have truly open conversation and to start to break down these barriers. So don't forget, leave your review, leave your feedback. And um, of course, let's just do this too. Don't forget to grab your free IEP training that I do every week. And that's over at IEPmasterclass.com. I'll talk to you guys soon.